Well, I'm glad to be with you tonight. Um, Brother Keith called me uh, towards the end of the week and asked me if I would be willing to preach, and and uh, of course I said yes, and and uh, then I started praying about uh, what what I would preach on tonight, and and um, I feel like I have a message that uh, God has laid on my heart. Uh, he laid it on my heart a few weeks ago, and and uh, so I've been studying on it, but I, I feel like it's the right the right message for tonight. Um, but before we get started, I, I wanted to thank you all for for voting me in as the children's minister. Um, it's a great honor and, and a privilege to uh, to serve your children and and to serve you all and to um, to help you to to raise disciples for Christ. And and I take that very seriously. And, and Miss Kelsey takes it very seriously as well. And, and uh, we consider that a great honor. And and I was I was pleased when Brother Keith told me I was on the short list. And and uh, I, I know the there was never really a long list, but of uh, people that desire to, to do children's ministry, but, you know, anyway, so uh, I, I consider that a great honor, and thank you for that, and, and um, um, so um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 tonight, if y'all want to be turning over there, um, we're going to start in, in uh, verse 13, um, and uh, we're going to look at a passage of scripture um, from the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, generally this, this passage that we looked at, look at, Tonight is, is uh, sometimes it's, it's preached in one or two or even three different sections, but um, we're going to look at it together as a whole because I feel like that there's a message there as a whole tonight, and, and uh, so we're, we're going to be reading through um, on down to the end of the chapter, um, and, um, and so we're, but we're going to pick up in verse 13 um, tonight, so if you want to turn with me there. Um, Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. And narrow is the gate and difficult is the road that leads to life, and very few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing that are inwardly are ravaging wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruits, but every bad tree produces bad fruit. A tree that cannot produce a, tr a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, neither a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce fruit, good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, "Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name?" And do many miracles in your name. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the river rose, and the winds blew and, and pounded that house, yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the wind blew and pounded the house, and it collapsed. And it was a great, with a, it collapsed with a great collapse. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, not because he was teaching them with one who had authority and not like their scribes. Father God, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we just thank you for all of your many, many blessings, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word tonight, Father, and God, I pray that you'll just set me aside, Lord, and use me as your mouthpiece, God, and that there will not be any fleshly speak that comes through my mouth tonight, Lord, but just your words tonight, Father. And, and uh, God, I pray that, that you'll just sit down with us, Lord, and that you'll open all of our hearts, God, to receive your word and that you'll help us to apply it to our lives in the way that you would have us to, Father. And God, I pray that if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know your son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that, that you'll draw upon their heart tonight, Lord, and if they will not leave this place until they get that straightened out, God, and we just, we just, uh, we praise you tonight, Lord, and we thank you for all of your many blessings. It's in Jesus' blessed and holy name we pray, Amen. So as we uh, as we pick up here in, in verse thirteen, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, as I as I mentioned earlier, and this is a a passage of Scripture where Jesus was was using plain speech; he wasn't talking in parables. Um, so whenever he when he he picks up here and he starts talking about the narrow gate. He, he literally means you enter through the narrow gate. And later on, he refers to himself as the sheep gate. All right, And so that narrow gate is, is, 
is the following Jesus there. And, and uh, so he picks up and he, he talks about the narrow gate and the broad gate um, and, and how the broad gate leads to um, destruction, all right? And the narrow gate leads to life. And, and uh, he, he talks about those two things. And we've heard that over and over again, all right? We've heard that, we've heard that preached. We've heard that we need to enter the narrow gate and, and that the path that Jesus has laid out for, for us is not necessarily an easy path, but it's a good path. It's not necessarily a path that's, that's going to be simple to walk while we're on this earth. It's not necessarily a path that's going to be comfortable. It's not necessarily a path that's, that's going to lead you to great riches. It's not, it's not that kind of path, all right? But at the end of the day, it leads to life. It leads to everlasting life. All right, and we've heard that preached. We've heard about the we've heard about the wide path and the, the 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 smooth road and the easy way that most of the world goes down and and how easy it is to to slide through that gate. I I imagine that that it's it's just like a lot of times we we, we traveled a couple weeks ago and we were going through Nashville and and uh, it's really easy to stay in those you know four or five lanes of traffic instead of trying to hit that one off ramp that goes this way, or maybe it's this way, depends on where you're at, all right, as you're going down through there, and that's how I imagine that wide, that wide gate, is that it doesn't even feel like you're going through a gate, you know, and that's the way the world wants us to feel, it wants us to feel that we're just kind of rolling through life, and, and you're, you know, you're a good person, and, and your life is good, and, and why, why do you need to fool with trying to go down this, this what seemingly narrow, treacherous path over here, that is going to be different. Why would you fool with that whenever you have this nice, smooth, easy way to go? And, and so that's, that's what Jesus starts out here, and that's kind of his introduction. That's kind of his introduction to what he's going to explain to us next. All right, and so that's what I want to start out with, is, is I want you to be thinking about that narrow gate and the wide gate, all right? Because he shifts gears here, and he, and he starts to talk about false prophets. He starts to talk about false prophets and how they come to us in sheep's clothing, all right? And, and, um, but what I want to see here and, and, what, uh, and, and what really drew me to this passage is that whenever Jesus talks about false prophets, he talks about them in a different way than Paul does. He talks about them almost in a loving way, almost in a way that, that, um, that it's, it's different. It's just different. All right, and so I want us to look at this because I feel like that, that, um, that we may, at times, as we, as we are going through life, we may, we may be on that wide road, all right, and we may fall into some of these categories here that Jesus is talking about, and, and the first one that he brings up here is the false prophet, all right, and uh, so that's, that's the, first, the first person I want to talk to you about is the false prophet or the one that has it all together. All right, um, and so before we can really see, before we can really understand how these false prophets are, all right, they come to us in what Jesus describes as sheep's clothing. So they look like us. They act like us. They act like they're on the narrow path. They act like they're followers of Jesus. They act like they're church members. They, they may be church members. They may have their name on the roll. They act like they know Jesus. They act like they pray. They act like all these things. They're wearing sheep's clothes. All right? And so, but before we can understand these people and who they are, we have to understand what fruit is. All right? And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about fruit because Jesus spends several sentences here talking about fruit. And a lot of times in this day and age, we don't understand even what fruit is in a church. We don't understand what that means when the Bible talks about fruit. So I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about fruit. Um, before, before I talk about what fruit is, I want to talk about what fruit is not. All right? Fruit is not numbers. Fruit is not how many people are in the Sunday school class that you teach or how many years you've taught Sunday school or, or how many people that come and listen to you when you go preach somewhere or, or how many people that you bring in whenever you stand up and sing a special. That's not what fruit is, all right? And that's a lot of times the way that we rationalize things. You, I follow some preachers on Facebook and, and there are several of them that will get on there and they'll be like, I had 487 people that showed up at this revival that I preached last night and I had 133 of them that stood up 
and, and said that they wanted to know Jesus, and then I had 87 of them come down to be counseled, and, and then I had, and they give all these numbers. Why do they give those numbers? Because it's about them. It's about what they're doing. All right, and that's, that's the way that we focus as a materialistic society is that we, we have to put numbers on everything, all right? When we go through the Bible, even at times, you know, we've been going through Acts, and, and there are times that they said, they, they'll say, a great multitude was saved, a great multitude. Well, that, that, that's not a number. That's a, a great multitude. We don't know how many that is, all right? In this day and age, we think of a great multitude to be be thousands of people, but we don't know what a great multitude to them was because it didn't matter. It was that a, a large number of people came to know Jesus because of what was done previously, because they were following what Jesus told them to go do. They were following the Great Commission, and they were going out, and they were preaching his word, and, and people were getting saved. It's not about the number, all right? And so that's, what, that's not what fruit is. Fruit is not what we're doing or... or or activities, or, or programs, or, or numbers, or anything like that, all right? So we have to understand that that's not fruit, all right? So what is fruit if it's not, if it's not numbers and, and evidence, all right? Well, when the Bible talks about fruit, it's talking about what's coming from the inside. It's talking about, if you'll look over with me in Matthew chapter 12, in verse, in, in verse 33, all right, Jesus is speaking again, and he says, um, he says in verse 33, he says, either make, a tree, make the tree good, and its fruit will be good, or make the tree bad, and its fruit will be bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, he's talking to the Pharisees right now, brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the mouth speaks an overflow from the heart. All right, so the fruit that we produce in our life comes from within. It comes from within, within, and it comes as an overflow of what we're putting into our bodies. It comes from an overflow of, what, of, of when we read the Word, whenever we spend time in prayer. All right, it comes from an overflow from that. So if we want to look, look at what good fruit is, you can turn with me over to Galatians. In chapter 5, all of y'all have read this before, all right? In Galatians chapter 5, Paul, Paul talks to the Galatians about what fruit is, all right? So the fruit comes from the spirit that's in our heart, that comes out. That is what this fruit is, all right? So I, I say then, walk by the spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other. So that you do what you so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, all right? If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious: sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, adultery, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissension, fractions, envy, drunkenness, carousing and anything similar that's the bad fruit that's the bad fruit that jesus is talking about over here in matthew i'm warning you about these things as i've warned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of god but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. All right? So fruit is an overflow of the spirit that's in your heart. It's an outpouring, an unnatural amount of love. It's an unnatural amount of patience. It's an unnatural amount of joy. It's joy whenever you are in a situation that you shouldn't have joy in. It's patience whenever you, you deal with people that don't deserve your patience. It's love that you, that you bestow upon people that have done wrong to you. That's what this fruit that Jesus is talking about. That is the good fruit. That is the fruit that we can't produce as humans. This is the fruit that can't come through us, through our flesh. It can only come from outpouring of the spirit that's within. 
All right, and that's the fruit that Jesus is talking about over there. All right, over in Matthew chapter 7. All right, and so, and so as, as we read down through there, he says that these, that these people that, that um, are, he declares as false prophets, all right, they come to us in sheep's clothing and that we'll recognize them by their fruit. But there's another phrase in between there that I want you to see. I don't want you to miss it. All right? Inward, but inwardly, they are ravaging wolves. But inwardly, they are ravaging wolves. All right? So these people, the reason why I say they're the people that, that have it all together, all right, is because the people that are false prophets that are living among us, that are, that are trying to be church members and they're trying to be good husbands and they're trying to be good wives and, and they're trying to do all of these things, they're living their life as a performance. They're living their life above their means. They're living their life and they're trying to put on a, a face of something that they don't have. They don't have it, church, and, they, and they're miserable. They're miserable. On the inside, they're ravaging wolves. And that, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be ravaging wolves outwardly towards somebody. That's, that's, it's saying on the inside, they're ravaging wolves. They're miserable. They're living life as a performance. And they're, they're going through their life trying to be something that they think they're supposed to be, but they can't be it. All right? And so they're in, internally, they're, inter, they're ravaging wolves. All right? They, they have this natural or fleshly desire that Galatians says pulls against that of the Spirit. All right? And that's tearing them apart on the inside as if they're full of ravaging wolves. All right? Instead of having love, they're full of envy and selfish ambition. Instead of having joy, they have hatred and outbursts of anger. Instead of having peace, they have dissension and jealousy and strife. Instead of having patience, they have, they're anxious and they're impure. Instead of, instead of having self-control, they practice adultery and sexual immorality and drunkenness. And that's the way that they live. All right? And we say, well, those people aren't among us. That's because you don't see it. It's because they're wearing sheep's clothes. They're setting among us. They may even be setting among, among us tonight. You may say, well, that's kind of, that's kind of me, Brother Matt. I kind, of, I kind of dabble in some of that stuff, and, and I just don't know, all right? And I, I just tell you that that's okay, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. We're going to talk about how to not be a false prophet here in a minute. We're going to talk about how to get out of that situation if you say that's me, all right? But I want you to know that there are people among you that are miserable, there are people that show up here one or two Sundays a month and they try to act like they're a Christian to appease their mom or their grandma or their wife or their husband, but they're miserable. They're miserable because they're living life as a false prophet. They're trying to produce good fruit when it's not there. And inwardly, they're ravaging wolves. And why are they like that? Well, if we look at Galatians, it tells us why they're like that in the very next verse. After it talks about the, the fruit of the Spirit in verse 20, it, 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 I'm going to back up to verse 22, but the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So those that are, that are living as, as inwardly as ravaging wolves, they haven't crucified that old man. They think that they can do it all on their own. They think that they can control him. They think that they can, they can keep everything in check and that they can paint this pretty picture of the way that they, they think their life is supposed to be. But inside, they're being torn apart. They're being torn apart and they, they feel like they're ravaging wolves on the inside. That's that old man that has never been crucified. We are called to crucify the flesh with Christ. If you've never done that today, if you've never done that and you're miserable, this is the answer, all right? And we're going to talk about that more, all right? So that is the, that's the false prophet, the one that is, it is trying to paint a picture and the one that's trying to live a life that they can't live, all right? That's the false prophet. The other, the other church member I want to talk to you about today is a very personal one to me, something that, that Jesus showed me a few weeks ago. And, uh, but I want to talk to you about um, the, in verse 21, I want to read down through um, verse 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we di didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do many miracles in your name? Then I'll announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. I never really understand, understood that passage of Scripture completely until just a few weeks ago. I, I really didn't. I didn't understand how, how we could do things in the name of Jesus and, and at the same time not believe in him and not put our faith and trust in him. I didn't understand how, how that was possible, but it is. It is, and so I've called this person the unadopted church member. The unadopted church member. All right, and, and so um, I come to understand this verse a few weeks ago. Um, just a little backstory, if y'all if y'all don't know, Kelsey and I we used to be foster parents, and we we had a, a girl that came and she stayed with us for several years, and and um, she was basically abandoned by her family in a roundabout way through the legal system, and and um, and so it came time, and the judge was judge was basically tired of dealing with her case, and he said, okay, you're you're going to be adopted, you're up for adoption. And, uh, and so they looked at us, and they wanted to know, will you adopt her? And I said, if she wants to be adopted. That was my response, because in prayer, Kelsey and I had made that decision many years ago, before we started this process, that we're not seeking to adopt children, but we're not going to turn a child away. And so in prayer, we had decided that this time was coming, and that, that we were going to do this, and so uh, one day... we me and this, this young lady were riding in the car, and I, I started to have this conversation with her. And I said, I said now, the court is saying that, that, um, that you either have to be adopted or, or go to another living situation, or, or um, we, we have to make some arrangements. Um, but the most logical arrangement is for you to be adopted. And, um, and so I just want you to know that Kelsey and I love you and that, that we're willing, if you want to be adopted, We'll go through the process with you at, at our expense, and we'll go through that process, whatever it takes, and we'll adopt you. I said, but I want you to understand this. Whenever we adopt you, you're going to be our child. You are going to, you're, our name is going to be on your birth certificate. You will be a Chadwick, which don't mean a whole lot, other than the fact that, that you'll be disciplined like a Chadwick. You'll be treated like a Chadwick. You will, you will have the same rules that a Chadwick will have when they reach your age. You know, you'll be loved, you'll be cared for for as long as you want to be loved and cared for, and you'll have an inheritance just like, just like you were my naturally born child. But you'll be treated like a Chadwick. And that's what I told her. And she said, no. I don't want to be adopted. I don't want to be your kid. And I said, Okay. That's fine. I will love you, and you're welcome to stay at my house as long as you want to. And when it's time for you to go, you can go. So that, was, that happened, and, and that was probably two years ago. And, and time went by, and we, we loved on her until she turned 18. And, and then we tried to love on her a little bit longer, and then, and then she went about her merry way and, and wanted to be in charge of her life. And so she left. And uh, so... How does that get around to understanding this passage? Um, a few weeks ago, I was, I was in the middle of doing some work outside, and, and I was hot and sweaty, and it was kind of noisy, and, and uh, all of a sudden, I got a phone call. It was an unknown number. from it, I didn't have it in my phone, and, and, uh, but I, because of my job, I, I answer lots of phone numbers, and, and so I answered it. And it was a voice that I didn't really recognize, and it said, I, I, need, to know, uh, I need to know how much how much money I made in, in, 20, in 2021 or something like that and, and just rattling off this stuff. And I said, who is this? And she said her name and, and I said, I don't, I don't have this information. I'm, I'm busy right now. You wanted, to rule, you wanted to run your life. You're going to have to go find this information on your own. And I hung up the phone. And when I did that, God tapped on my heart and he said, that's what this passage means. That's what this means. He said that there are people that come into our churches. There are people that come and, and they come into and they, they, they use God as, a, as an escape route. All right? That, that young girl, she, she liked to call me dad whenever, whenever she was dealing with the police. 
Or whenever she had a problem at school, I became dad real quick. But she didn't want me to be her dad when it came time to do discipline. She didn't want me to be her dad when it came time for me to impact how she was going to spend the rest of her life. She didn't want me to be dad in those situations because there were consequences there. And that is the way a lot of times that we treat God. That's the way a lot of times that we approach Jesus. Whenever we get down in a hole, we want to go and we want to pray and we want to say, help me. Help me, Jesus. I, I, I need out of this hole. I've, I've, I've got myself in this situation or I'm wrapped up in sin or, or I'm having this trouble and, and we seek him out. But then when times are good again, we go about our own merry business. That's not a relationship, folks. That's not a relationship. All right? Jesus came to this earth and he died upon the cruel, cruel cross of Calvary so that we could have a relationship so that we could have daily prayer with him and with the Father, so that we could have a path to heaven, so that we didn't have to worry about the law, and we didn't have to worry about the burdens of the past. We didn't have to worry about the old covenant because we have the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And that's what he came for. He came so that we can be children. Over in, in John, in John, in, in the, first, the first chapter of John, in verse 10, it says, talking about Jesus, it says, He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize them. He recognized him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all of those who did receive, them, receive him, he gave them the right to be the children of, the, of God, to those who believe in his name. If you believe in the name of Jesus Christ and you put your faith and your trust in that, you are an adopted child of God. You have the same rights as Jesus himself. If you have done that, you are his child. And with that, there are consequences. Out of love, God does, chasten his, he does discipline his children. I can't say that other word. But he does discipline his children. Out of love, he does allow his children to go through trials and tribulations so that they may grow in their faith, so that whenever big trials and big tribulations come along, it doesn't knock them off their feet. Out of love, he allows us to go through those things. Out of love, he steers our life in, in, in different ways so that we can have impacts on other people's lives. And sometimes those ways are difficult. Sometimes they're not comfortable. But he does it out of love. And we have to put our faith and trust in that. All right? As an adopted child of God. So, that's the second, the second person that I want you to see tonight is the unadopted church member. If that's you tonight, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about whether you, you're here because someone wants you here or you're here because you feel like you are in a bad situation and you want some relief. I want you to think about why you're here tonight. As we go through, I'm, I'm going to go to my last point tonight. And I want to talk about the foundations. All right, so when we get to verse 24, we encounter a word um, that kind of directs us on how we need to understand what's coming next. Jesus says, therefore. He says, therefore. And anytime we see the word, therefore, excuse me, anytime we see the word, therefore, as I tell the little kids, we have to figure out why it's therefore. All right? And so... Therefore, is there in this situation because Jesus has just said some hard stuff. He spent the last several chapters saying some hard stuff. All right? And he's going to wrap it up right here. And I think it's a good place to wrap up tonight. So I want you to look down with me in verse 24. I'm going to go ahead and read through, and then we're going to go back and talk about it. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell... And the rivers rose, and the wind blew and pounded that house, yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who, who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the rivers rose, and the wind, the wind blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed with a great collapse. We've heard this, we've been taught this since we were children. We've been taught this Bible story over and over again. There's even like a song about it. I couldn't think of it earlier, but there's a song about this, about this, about the wise man who built his house on the rock and 
one that built his house on the sand. We've heard this and heard this over and over again, but this is just an analogy that Jesus is using to say, you need to listen to the things that I just said. You need to listen to what was just talked about. You need to listen about the false prophet. You need to listen about those that call on my name but are not my children. You need to listen, and you need to do something with that if you haven't. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Is, and so what I want you to think about tonight, I want you to examine your foundation. I want you to examine your foundation. Because let's, read, let's reread verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. That word hears there, that hears, is not necessarily like the English word that we use today for hears. It's not just hearing words into your head. All right? That's not just what that means. Um, that, the Greek word that, that is behind that, I won't even try to pronounce it, but that it means to understand. It means to have a deep understanding. It means to have an understanding that goes past head knowledge and goes down into your heart. All right? I equate it to conviction. All right? So if you hear wor these words tonight, and you're convicted in your heart, as, the, as you hear them in your ears, if you absorb it into your mind and you're convicted in your heart, and you're a wise man, and you're a wise man, you're going to do something with it. You're going to realize that, hey, I've been mistaken my, during my life. I've been building on a foundation that's not real. I've been building on a foundation that I put in place, not one that Jesus put there, and, I, and it's going to crumble one day, and it's going to be a great collapse. All right? If that's you today, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about if you're, if you're the one that's, that's got a sheep's coat on and you're not really one of those sheep for yourself, but you're trying to hide in with the middle of the flock and you're miserable and you feel like a, a ravaging wolf on the inside, I want you to think about that. Do you want to be called a wise man? Do you want to be called a wise man? Because the wise man admits that. He puts aside his pride and he builds his house on the rock, Amen. not a rock, right. the rock, right. the rock, that's Jesus Christ. Right. If you don't build your life, if you don't start out at the bottom with Jesus Christ as your foundation, everything that builds on top of it is rubbish. Everything that you try to put on top of it is rubbish, all right? And so we have to make sure that we have an understanding of that, all right? I would be remiss, though, if I didn't point this out to you just like we would if we were telling children this story. Both of these houses go through a storm. Both of these houses experience hardship. Both of these houses experience trials. All right? One of them stands, though, because it has its faith and its trust and it's put its believeth in Jesus as its foundation. But both of them experience hardship. All right? And so you have to understand that tonight, too. Okay, is that whenever you put your faith in Jesus, it, it, we go back to that narrow and that wide road. The, the narrow road is rough. It's windy. All right? It's hard to travel sometimes. All right? But few people find it, is what Jesus says. Okay? So there's going to be storms along that as well. All right? So um, I'm off my notes as Brother Keith would say. Um, but I want, I want to go back real quick, and I want to wrap up back at the very beginning with that narrow and the, the narrow gate and the wide road. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that one last time. So we, we've talked about, we've talked about, um, we've talked about the, the false prophet that's in the sheep's clothes. We've talked about the unadopted child that refuses to refuses to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but likes to reap the benefits of, of being involved in the church, being, in, being a member of the church. He likes to reap the benefits of that. All right, so let's go back and read verses 13 and 14 again. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the road, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who will go through it. How narrow is the gate, and difficult is the road that leads to life, and few find it. 
So as we examine our foundations tonight, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about which one of those roads you're on. I want you to think about where, what your foundation is in tonight. And I just want you to take a moment and really examine yourself, all right? Examine, examine your position tonight. And uh, I, just, I just wanted, I wanted to share that with you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close there. Um, and in closing, I, I, the last thing I want to say is that I have, I, I got to admit to you, I have, I have a little bit of a, a, um, a little bit of a vice, just a small one, nothing bad. Um, but whenever, I, whenever I'm on road trips, I like to occasionally listen to country radio just a little bit. And uh, I heard a song the other day that I feel like is really applicable to this story um, and to this, to, what we've, to this sermon that we've heard tonight because I think a lot of times we let pride get in our way. Whenever we, whenever we have made this, made this life that on the outside looks perfect, on the outside we feel like we've got people fooled and, and we've, we've got things the way that we want them and and we feel like that, that we have protected ourselves, and, and we may even have ourselves fooled from time to time, convinced that, that we, you know, we are the real deal, all right? And, and so, but I heard this song the other day, and I thought, I actually told this to Kelsey. Um, it's, it's a song about a man who's apparently done something to his wife. I, ask Andy, he may know what happened. But, um, he'd apparently done something to his wife, and his wife was mad at him, and and it goes through, and the, the verse of the song talks about she's breaking his fishing rods, and she's throwing his, throwing his clothes out on the lawn, and she's putting his, selling his guns to the pawn shop and all this stuff. And then it gets down to the chorus. It gets down to the chorus, and he says, I'm, I'm going to read it to you because I'm going to mess it up. I didn't listen to it that many times. It says, he says in the chorus, he says, I know right where I went wrong. I know just what got her gone. It turned my life into a country song, and I ain't got nobody to blame but me. I ain't got nobody to blame but me. And I told Kelsey when I heard that, I said, there are going to be people burning in hell for eternity saying that same thing. Because one thing we have to remember tonight is when we get there, if you get there, I hope you don't, I ain't going. But if you get to hell, you're going to remember everything that happened on this earth. When we get to heaven, we won't remember anything. We won't remember the hardships. We won't remember the sorrows. But whenever you get in hell, you're going to remember every time you heard a sermon and was drawn and convicted in your heart. You're going to remember every time that you had a preacher stand up and tell you that it's a whole lot easier to get saved right here when it's 69 degrees and it's carpeted on the floor. It's a whole lot easier to get saved right now than to be lost and undone for the rest of your life. You're going to hear that. And you're going to remember these words that you ain't got nobody to blame. You ain't got nobody to blame. Amen. All right? Father God, we thank you for tonight, Lord. And we thank you for all of your many blessings, God. And, and uh, Father, I thank you for your word tonight, Lord. And, Father, I